Equatorial Guinea, Africa's only Spanish-speaking nation, borders Cameroon and Gabon, and its capital city, Malabo, lies 25 miles from the coast of Cameroon on Bioko Island. The first discovery was made in 1984 in the Alba gas condensate field. Equatorial Guinea began producing oil and gas in the 1990s, and the country has become one of the largest producers in Sub-Saharan Africa. But with its oil fields aging, and production and global prices still declining. Equatorial Guinea is attempting to breathe new life into its energy sector by diversifying into gas and petrochemicals, bringing new oil fields online and repositioning itself as a services hub for West Africa. For a while, we were considered in Equatorial Guinea the poorest country in Africa. It was not just because of monetary value, but because of isolation. We were in the island mainland, we have a mainland, but at, at the same time we, we, we suffered one thing, and that was the political instability. And that political instability was disencouraging a lot of the investors to come. The other issue that we have is that we did not have a good starting in oil and gas. Our neighbors like Nigeria, like Cameroon, like Gabon, have a lot of consultants who help them. Uh, even in the city of Malabo, it was very ironic because we actually were seeing all the flaring in Nigeria. It was so dark in Malabo. The only light that we saw it was the flaring in Nigeria. So, and you could see all the horizon. And the horizon, you see the flaring in Nigeria. And then, of course, in the, in the south of, of the continental part, you see also the flaring of Gabon. So for us, it was really like a punishment of uh, Almighty God, saying, well, Nigeria is in the north, they have oil. Uh, Cameroon is in the east, they have oil. Then you have Gabon in the south, they have also oil. We we're asking ourselves, how can all of these guys, all our neighbors have oil, we are in the middle, have no oil. And it was until uh, wild cutters, new venture companies, like Walter International, like United Meridian, like Triton, that actually go where people tell them not to go. If you actually tell them, don't go, that's exactly where they go. And they went there, and they actually they decided that, you know, there could be an opportunity, and they would talk a gamble. And I have to say that U.S. companies actually are very good, especially in Texas, because they are really cowboys. And cowboys don't like people to tell them what to, what to do. So if you tell them, don't go there, that's exactly where they go. So it was Walter, he went there, drill the same well that the Spanish drill, Hepsa, um, at that time. And it was a little bit deeper, and they have a discovery. Immediately when the Alba area was discovered, everybody in the industry in the region was coming to attention. He said, what's wrong? All the reports say that there's nothing in Equatorial Guinea. I can right now, we have a discovery. So from there, it created a situation in which Everybody changed the plan. So they start coming to the country. They start doing more exploration. They did the drill in the United Meridia. They have another discovery. Then it came Triton. And that's really the story of Equatorial Guinea, in which we always say that Equatorial Guinea was discovered by Wildcutter and, and independent and small oil and gas companies. The transformation is like the transformation from night to day. When I first went to Equatorial Guinea in 1997, early 1997, it had only just recently uh, begun its production of, of petroleum products. Um, when you go there now, nearly 20 years later, you will be amazed at what uh, the country has been able to do uh, with the proceeds uh, from, from, from its industry. So it has been a great transformation, uh, a great development in those, uh, in those 20 years. Offshore oil and gas exploration is a capital-intensive industry, one that requires companies with the technical and financial capacity to make complex projects possible. Underexplored African countries compete to draw investment from foreign companies. This often results in a difficult balancing act between serving the interests of the country and remaining attractive for inbound investment. We have a very proactive, a very direct communication and also approach to investors. We are very frank, we are direct. So we are not wasting anybody's time. We are very frank on our opportunity. We are very frank regarding our fiscal terms. And in the fiscal terms is this, if you are agreeing with this, we immediately jump into the memorandum. And from the memorandum, we jump into the model contract. And in a record time, 
we can be in a situation to sign a contract and ratify and you start doing the work. There is tremendous uh, demand uh, to participate in Equatorial uh, Guinea's petroleum sec uh, sector. So clearly uh, the terms of its of its uh, engagement with investors is, is, uh, is not in any way a deterrent to, uh, to that demand. As a U.S. company based in Houston, Texas, operating in foreign countries, the importance of sanctity of contract cannot be overstated. The country provides a relatively low-cost environment for both the exploration and the production phases given the presence of a very well-developed hydrocarbon industry. We represent the government of, of Equatorial Guinea in regards to some of its negotiations with its oil investors. So we believe uh, that uh, its most current PSCs are uh, top of the, top of the, the, the industry. Um, very modern, uh, very competitive, um, but also uh, very well thought out and uh, win-win uh, for, for all parties. The fundamentals are strong. The geology in the country is great and the way of doing business has been improved. But also what is important in Equatorial Guinea at this moment is that you have a government that is willing to attract investors, is willing to, be, to accommodate investors. We are more flexible than ever and uh, we think this is the right time to do exploration because it's cheaper. We think that for a company to take a decision to drill a well is not only the technical decision, it's not a technical information, but also it's financial. We want the companies to have enough time to, first of all, no drill a dry hole, and second, to raise the financing that is needed to drill a well. Over the next five to ten years, oil consumption growth in Africa will be the fastest of any region globally, and I think that will show investors that there are more opportunities there that haven't yet been tapped. It's highly likely that much of the hydrocarbon endowment of Equatorial Guinea has yet to be discovered and realized. Recent successes in the Atlantic Transform margin highlight the significant potential of this frontier which remains particularly underexplored in Equatorial Guinea, both in deep water and with a few exceptions on the shelf. Equatorial Guinea is trying to build a big industrial base around its oil and gas sector, and for the longer term and more sustainable economic growth, that's a very prudent approach to be taking. The first thing that we are doing that is different than a lot of countries who are preparing acreage is that we did all the seismic on the entire area. We did not only the seismic, we did the pro processing. So when a company or an individual an investor is coming, they don't have to go through the phase of looking for a boat, doing the seismic, looking for a seismic company or a processing company to process, because the information is already there. So once you enter, you immediately are focusing all your funds in processing. By the time you do the processing, you already see the prospect. So in a period of one year, you are going from the exploration, you immediately are jumping into the drilling. Anyone uh, interested to invest in Equatorial Guinea can talk with uh, companies already in the country. Companies like ExxonMobil, Marathon Oil, Noble Energy, and Marada Hess who have not only worked in the country, have worked in the country, they have been able to develop the area, some of the fields have been already producing more than expecting. You have service companies who already have been working in Equatorial Guinea, they are working in Equatorial Guinea, the future work in Equatorial Guinea. We have also a workforce that has been trained this through the different phases from exploration and development and production. So clearly Equatorial Guinea has a clear advantages when we talk about uh, investors coming to Equatorial Guinea. The recent plunge in oil prices has put enormous pressure on producers and on host African governments who have lost significant oil and gas tax revenues. Countries like Equatorial Guinea that depend on oil exports to drive economic growth have been forced to adopt downturn strategies to remain competitive. These adjustments can be difficult, but countries with established industries are adept at surviving these market changes. In a climate like this, you can't fold your hands and not invest. You just have to identify the right types of opportunities that will have broader economic impact. It's inevitable when you have a commodity price cycle like this that countries have to scale back some of their spending. And that may mean that some of the large scale infrastructure projects that governments have planned will be hit. Uh, but I think we're seeing an attempt by the government through the diversification away from purely oil exploration production to the infrastructure side 
um, of the market as a way of longer term uh, sustainability and especially the fiscal incentives that will be offered to the private sector uh, whether that's in terms of taxes or tax holidays and other sort of trade incentives will go a long way in helping to attract FDI in an environment like this. A lower price environment can actually benefit more established producers. Companies in this type of environment tend to target lower risk, lower cost ventures and Equatorial Guinea has a lot of proven shallow water acreage and a lot of pre-existing infrastructure. It's well positioned along the Equatorial Transform and it's got some great blocks in the deep water and the ultra deep water areas. So exploration has been to an extent de-risked and where a discovery is made it can be tied back into that infrastructure at a significantly lower cost. One of the countries in the Gulf of Guinea who is going to come out of this crisis stronger is Equatorial Guinea. When the oil price uh, started having the downturn the end of 2014, it took us only one month to readjust our budget. We immediately saw that this was a serious crisis both the Minister of Mine and the Minister of Finance presented immediately to the presidency, presented immediately to the parliament, so we readjust the budget immediately. We reduced or paralyzed all the infrastructure projects. And not only we did that, after six months, we did a new reevaluation, and we actually discovered that the price kept going down. So we needed to do another year adjustment. So rather than going, maintain the budget, ask for debt, immediately just alleviate in the short term this problem, we said no. Let's not get in debt ourselves because of these circumstances. Let's adjust a budget. Equatorial Guinea has some advantages when it comes to the declining oil prices in that their demand for budget and resources uh, is less stretched than it is in, in larger, larger economies. They have done well. Uh, they've also done well over the years, as best I can tell, in uh, preserving the revenues and resources that it's developed so that they are able to to weather the storm of the lower oil prices. In 2007, the government of Equatorial Guinea adopted the 2020 Horizon programs. One of the mandates of that program is uh, the construction of the main infrastructures that uh, will help the Republic of Equatorial Guinea to be uh, at some point developed. And uh, by the time the price of oil started falling down, most of these very big infrastructures such as uh, airports, ports, roads were already, if not concluded, at a very advanced state. Once considered a byproduct of the oil production process, natural gas is an important and strategic resource for exports, petrochemicals, and for generating electricity. Countries with large gas reserves must decide how to best monetize their resources, and seizing opportunities requires strong public-private partnerships that make world-class mega-projects possible. The opportunity for gas diversification in Equatorial Guinea is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, gas has several uses, obviously, and one of the most uh, uh, prominent structures for Equatorial Guinea to adopt in terms of monetizing its gas resources is LNG, liquefied natural gas, um, for which there are several ongoing projects in the country right now. And of course, that is going to lead to uh, a huge amount of export revenues for the country, uh, particularly with projects like the Fortuna LNG coming on stream. The Fortuna floating liquefied natural gas project is a very exciting project for Ophir and for Equatorial Guinea. It will be the first deep water FLNG project in sub-Saharan Africa. The Fortuna FLNG project is really important for Equatorial Guinea's gas sector. It's a very attractive project. It's got very low cost structures and it will allow for a doubling of both production and exports from 2019 when it comes online. Whilst you have a large scale project like Fortuna, you also want to make sure that were there to be a fundamental shift in commodity prices in the markets that Equatorial Guinea still has a, a gas revenue base, gas utilization revenue base that allows it to balance the potential risk from global markets with supplying to what could potentially be a fairly stable domestic regulatory environment for its gas. And by that I mean in terms of uses around petrochemical uses around uh, fertilizers or uses around the power sector. And we know demand in that sector is growing very steadily. There's also a potential to pack a regasification plant 
offshore South Africa and sell more gas to not just South Africa, but also Namibia as well. Namibia has a huge gas uh, to power plant in Kudu, which they've been trying to get up for years, but they've not been able to get gas to. And then, I mean, specifically in West Africa, you have Ghana, you have Cote d'Ivoire. If you look at neighboring Gabon as well too, neighboring Gabon is trying to get more gas to build power plants at the same time, and they will need to get gas, which they don't really have so much. Um, so Kudu Guinea could position to develop a pipeline to sell into that as well. Building an oil and gas industry from nothing takes decades. In addition to attracting investment and technical know-how, host governments need foreign companies to help them develop their national workforce so that they can one day take over and run the industry on their own. This requires governments to create policies that promote the development of local know-how, but without deterring investors with excessive red tape. Equatorial Guinea is pushing a lot of local content at the moment, trying to get more um, oil companies to involve locals in their um, in their production, in their facilities and all that. But you need to balance incentives to ensure that you're not just pushing local content without the right support structure behind it. For instance, in terms of education, you target specific segments, you develop the content locally in the universities, you train, and if you need to send them abroad to learn and come back and teach them, you also need to adopt that kind of strategy. Well, Equatorial Guinea has been uh, the, the, in the oil and gas industry for more than 20 years now. And uh, there is a lot of uh, EG nationals that has been very well trained. They are very well prepared. You have skill set in the country already. With Equatorial Guineans having experience from working with service companies like Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, Oceaneering, and some of the big US oil service companies. But also, you are going to find a lot of young people, for example, coming out of Technology Institute that have been trained. So investing there right now, that issue of human capital, which was a problem 20 years ago, doesn't really exist. We have a lot of uh, local companies that have really uh, become uh, stronger during this situation. It could be because of the training or the alliances that they have signed with uh, foreign international companies. And of course, it's much cheaper uh, to acquire services from companies that are already uh, in the country. African governments really need to understand uh, what they hope to achieve by local content legislation. And for every country it will be different. If you're a new hydrocarbons producer, the evolution of your local content policy probably has to be a lot more considered uh, because on the one hand you want to attract huge sums of capital, on the other hand you also want to build your local capacity both in terms of technology and skills. Um, so if you take a country like Equatorial Guinea, you know, it has a smaller workforce uh, in terms of actual um, absolute numbers. But one of the benefits of having some of these large scale projects that we will start to see uh, quite a lot of skills and technology transfer as part of the process. So beyond having just foreign engineers or engineers who come from overseas or as contractors, you also have a steady stream. It's a small stream, but you gradually have a steady stream of engineers who themselves are Equatorial Guinean, who are from the region, and who can hopefully contribute to the longer term development of this type of infrastructure. Let's not compare ourselves with our neighbors. We are not competing with Cameroon. We are not competing with Nigeria. We are not competing neither with Ghana, with the rest, because they are countries that are very different than us. What we decided, we chose a model. It was Trinidad and Tobago and Singapore. The first phase of development has been done. And that's the phase of infrastructure. Now, what we are doing now is we will be managing to move the administrative capital from Malabo all the way to the mainline. So the city of Malabo will remain as a tourist and service city. The city of Bata will be as an industrial and heavy work city. And then the city of Jivlo, that's in Oyala, it will be the administrative city with the parliament, with the Senate and the presidency. So clearly we can say that we have achieved the Singapore model. We are not Singapore. Singapore is a completely different level, but Singapore started like us. And we have been thinking and looking how they started, and we will continue and I'll keep pressing all the time to express to everybody that the model that we should use is the Singapore model. And I think everybody is aligning this and, 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 it's been, and we have been very successful making sure that people always see this as a model. That's why I say that we are not yet there, but we should keep thinking and using that as a model.